thank you very much. And thank you also very much for the invitation to be here. It's a big honor for me to speak on the 305th anniversary of John Grant's um, Bills of Mortality, which is also seen as a starting point of the life table. And um, I consider myself as a life table chunky, so it's really a big honor for me to, to be here. So what I'm going to speak about now is what um, demographers, or let's say better some demographers are discussing connected to this instrument that was introduced, or the idea was introduced by John Grant, so the, um, the life table. And um, so what I'm going to speak about the so-called um, tempo effects that influenced my own work very much in the last years in the work of, of our research group. Um, I understood, and I see, of course, also that um, many demographers are here, but I heard also, I was told, that um, many colleagues from other disciplines are here, so I have probably to excuse with both of you, to the experts, that what I'm going to tell you is probably too simplistic for you, and with the others, I'm not, not sure, but um, <laughs> I hope that it's not too, too complex at the end. So, um, the idea of tempo effects goes basically back to a 1998 paper published by John Bongartz and Griffith Feeney with a um, title on the quantum and tempo of fertility, published in Population and Development Review, where they basically showed that what we measure in, in the, the conventional period total fertility rate, when the average age of um, childbirth is, is changing, is not only the quantum, so the average number of births or children, what we, as we interpret this measure, but there's also a component of this um, changing age inside. This was, to, for most demographers, not very surprising because um, this, this issue was known in, in different um, contexts. And um, the measure that Bongatz and Feeney suggested was very easy, and I think this is uh, also the reason why this was a quite big success story. So the tempo-adjusted um, total fertility rate is um, used very often in the meanwhile. A surprise, however, for most demographers, I guess, was that four years later they claimed that this idea of tempo effects that they introduced with the total fertility rate applies also to, to period life expectancy. <clears throat> um, this was quite um, puzzling or even paradox at the first moment because you measure basically with life expectancy, you measure tempo, so how can be a problem with some tempo distortions inside? So I'm trying to to put this all a little bit together in the presentation, and I prepared basically three, um, three issues for, for this lecture. First, what is this tempo di distortion in period mortality, what Bongartz and Feeney is speaking about? So I'm using a very simple theoretical model to explain you what is the idea and what I also think is an important issue to, to think about. And then in order to understand really what this measurement, what they suggest, or this um, adjustment that they suggest is doing, I try to classify this tempo approach between period and, and cohort analysis. And at the end, I would like to, to look at um, the empirical application of this measurement. So does it really matter at the end? Is it important to take care into that? Or do we get different results and different views of mortality when we take into account um, this, this tempo adjustment? So what is this tempo distortion period mortality? And I would like to to use basically the examples that Bongartz and, um, bon and Finn used themselves. I just used a little bit a different way of, of showing that. So, um, was here a pointer? There's also a pointer here. Yeah. Oh, that's a very weak pointer. Laser, yes. So it's just um, the, for demographers, the well-known part of the Lexis surface where we have here three calendar years, T0, T1, T2. And here I just picked an age group, just um, 62, to, to show this, um, uh, this tempo effect or this, this idea behind. So what I constructed here, what I used, um, is a population very simple with constant number of births and constant mortality conditions until T0. That means until this year nothing changed, the classical stable population assumption. And to make it very simple, we have only five um, cohorts every year. The interval between these births is 0. Two years, and all the deaths in this age group should occur in the age 62.5. So everything is constant, nothing is changing, very simple. And then in tier one, T1, we have some change of the situation. So we have a linear rise of the age at death by 0.2 years. And then from the next year on, everything remains constant again. Um, and 
the deaths now occur not anymore at 62.5, but at 62.7. So this is basically the very simple example like those used by, by Bongartz and Feeney. So what is the consequence now of this situation? And this I try to show with this arrows here, that is that when you see that we had this 0.2 years of birth intervals and the same intervals for the deaths before, but due to this change in the, um, uh, in the average age of death, the time interval between the deaths increases. And as a consequence of this, the deaths of this cohort here, so this would have been the old moment of deaths in the old regime, the deaths of this cohort are shifted to the next calendar year. Not very spectacular so far. So the question is, what consequence does this have for this age-specific death rates that we calculate in this, in this three years? And to make this um, more illustrative, I use now some, some numbers. So let's assume that um, each cohort here, 20,000 people arrive at age, at age um, 62, and in every cohort, 1,000 people die in age 62. That means that each of these arrows here means 20,000 people, and each of these dots means um, 1,000 deaths. So then we can calculate very easy the riskiest lift and the deaths for each period. So what is the numbers we need for the death rates? And then we can calculate here the riskiest lift here inside this square, 97,500, 5,000 deaths, so five dots. We get a death rate of 0.05128. And the next year, we have a higher number of, of riskiest lift due to this change in mortality, these improvements. And we have only four dots here, so 4,000 deaths. That brings a um, death rate of 0.04065. And in the last year, T2, we have, again, a little bit higher number of riskiest lift. But you see that we have, again, um, five dots here, so 5,000 deaths. And this brings us a death rate of 0.05076. It means when we just look at the death rates, the death rates would give us the information that between T0 and T1, the mortality is decreasing. So what we also assume, what we know what happened, mortality was going down. But when you look at the death rates, we get the information that between T1 and T2, the death rate is increasing. Although when we look at the figure, not even one cohort of this population experienced an increase of mortality. Each younger cohort was living longer than the one before, or at least not shorter. But when we see these um, figures, we would probably interpret this differently. If this is not yet spectacular enough, I think it's becoming very interesting when we um, include a second population. This was at least the example that convinced me that it's important to take care of that. Um, we have here population A. This is the population that I showed before. And we just introduced a second population B with exactly the same situation, no changes until T0, no changes after T1, but in T1, um, again, mortality changes. The difference is that the level was higher mortality level, so they died at 62.1. Now they died 62.5, and as a consequence, this increase here in the age of death is steeper. And when we look now, what, we, what kind of information we get when we calculate again the death rates, these are the ones that I showed before. Then we see that um, here in T0 and in T2, we get the information that we expect, that population A has a lower death rate than population B, but in this year of this mortality change, we get a lower death rate for population B than for population A, although we see that every cohort of population A lives longer than population B. This is basically the problem that Bongartz and Fini described this tempo distortion. And um, now I'm like to make three very important comments. So the first is the conventional death rates are not wrong. So this is one of the misunderstandings that um, the Morris thought that Bongartz and Feeney say what the usual life tables are is wrong, that they are not, obviously not. So they are correctly calculated. They are taking exactly care of what they should do. The deaths and the risk is lift. So this is not the problem. But I think what we should ask ourselves is do we, when we use period rates and measures derived from period rates. Do we really want that such a paradoxical situation like this population A and B can occur? And moreover, are users of period rates aware that such a paradoxical situation can occur? This is, I think, also a very important question. So when I think of my own, own works, 
in the past. I don't know, you have to answer this for, for yourself. But if I got a time series like that, that mortality was decreasing and then the rate increasing, or that we have here a situation where suddenly one population has a lower mortality than the other, I would automatically have asked myself what, what is the cause of this. And then I would automatically go to think about causes that are affecting um, this, this, this real people. And um, so I, I think we should ask ourselves is maybe this measurement that we use in such a situation when the conditions are changing is not the one that we should use when we think about the real people that are living in a period. This is the, the point and this is um, the background of this tempo adjustment. So the tempo adjustment is theoretically quite simple. Um, just to, the idea of Bongas and Fini is to divide this death rate, the conventional death rate, by this what they call period distortion index. So one minus the change in the average age at event occurrence. And then you get, would get this kind of age, tempo adjusted age specific death rates. And you see that here we would get information that mortality in population A is lower. Yeah. So that's the, um, the background of this problem or this um, uh, distortion of, of tempo effects. And of course, it is very difficult to understand what this, what this measure is really expressing. So this is one of the problems, I think, inside this discussion. So what is this tempo adjusted death rates? And I still think the best description of this difference between conventional and tempo adjusted death rates was um, given by, by Jim Vopel also in a 2002 paper where he's so referring to the life table that are constructed out of this measure said that this is a question of life expectancy at current rates versus life expectancy of current conditions. So this is basically what Bongatz and Fini aim at. So to get a better picture of these conditions of the real people that we have to separate from the rates. So you saw already in these graphs before that um, it's really quite complex to understand what these tempo adjusted measures are doing and there's somehow um, a mixture of, of period and, and, and cohort components inside. So I was looking at other approaches that are combining somehow period and cohort approaches and um, I identified three different ways of this kind of combination. So here these graphs you should just show the classical cohort approach that of course anal analysis mortality or whatever longitudinally along the cohort lines in the Lexis surface. And this here is um, illustrating of the period analysis that takes this cross-sectional summary of, um, of event rates. And the three measures that I identified, I call them translation measures, cross-sectional cohort averages and tempo measures. And I just really briefly want to, to show you what is the difference between this, these measures. Translation measures are very simple and they're really doing a translation from period into, into cohorts. So when you just look at this graph, the idea of translation measures is that you have, for example, a period life expectancy, and then you develop a formula or something to translate this under certain assumptions in, in life expectancy of cohorts or the other way around. So this is one um, approach that is existing in basically all kinds of demographic um, processes. I have here some examples for fertility and, and mortality. So just translating from one perspective to another. I think a very interesting approach that I was not aware so much before this tempo discussion started is what I um, called cross-sectional cohort averages. And the idea of this kind of measures is that you take into account complete cohort experiences. This is why I um, did the here in red color. But then you decide, you look at a specific period and you average these cohort experiences at this, in this year, in this period. So that means you weight um, the experiences of the cohorts accordingly that you get a cross-sectional um, measure for what's really going on in the cohorts at a certain time. And I like this approach in the meanwhile so much because I think this is basically what, at least what, what, what I think of when I look at a cross-sectional measure, when I, go back this step to understand what's going on in the real population. So I, I think this is really a very, very important alternative to, to the classical period approach. And the difference now uh, in the definition of Bongartz and Fini, um, what tempo adjustment is, is that they do not use as here the whole cohort lines, but only the changes of the cohorts that occur inside the period of analysis. So they try to adjust or suggest to adjust for these changes that the cohorts are experiences within 
um, within the period. This is the theoretical idea of tempo adjustment. Now to make this a little bit complex, coming back to the title, more complex than Grant could imagine, and even myself and <laughs> probably some others, when we look at the formulas that Bongartz and Fini suggest for this tempo adjustment, we can understand that the approach they use for fertility and mortality is, is unfortunately different. So for the fertility adjustment, they really do exactly this kind of adjustment, whereas this um, estimation of mortality tempo effects more follows this, what I described here as cross cohort, um, cross sectional cohort averages. So this makes it a little bit difficult because um, it's basically inconsistent what they do. The, the idea and the approach is the same, but the methods they suggest are um, basically different when you go back to what they are doing. But okay, leaving this problem now for the moment aside, I would, for the last three minutes or four of this presentation, look what all this matters really for the empirical analysis. So is this just some methodological discussions or is there really something behind that might be important when we try to understand processes that are behind changes in, in life expectancy and so on. And I've chosen the example of the differences in life expectancy between Eastern and Western Germany, not only because I am German and I lived in both parts for many years, so it's not only personal concern. Um, I think the situation that we have here, by far in Eastern Germany, is, is very, very interesting for a lot of respects. So we can learn a lot about processes that are influencing mortality. We have this population that was for 45 years um, separated from, from the West, living under different economic um, conditions with um, different access to medical care standards and so on. And then in, within a very few years, everything changed, became similar to the West. So how does such, such a population, what effects does this have on mortality? I think that's really a very, very important um, experiment to, to study the effects on mortality. So this is the difference in life expectancy at birth, the conventional life expectancy at birth that we observe in, in, in Germany, in East and West. So blue line for the men, this is West, life expectancy West minus life expectancy East. So we see clearly that here are three or four different phases. Say, let's start in the, in the 1970s when this gap between East and West opened. So the advantage in life expectancy of West Germany was increasing continuously until 1990, so the year of unification. The difference was around three and a half years in favor for the West among men and around three years for women. And then immediately from one year to the next, the gap closed even faster than before. And of course, many demographers, epidemiologists and so on, try to find out what are these factors that have such a strong impact on mortality that from one, let's exaggerate a little bit from one day to the other, they cause such an overall measure of life expectancy at birth to change so, so rapidly. So, the point is that until now, no one could really explain it. So there are some factors that are plausible and that can be shown with some individual data, but really when you do decomposition with some, you, you cannot explain it. And this brought me to the idea, maybe we use the wrong measure for this question. So this is strict um, period data here. And as I said in the beginning, what we are doing, we're thinking about the consequences or the effects in the real population. So this is now the trends in life expectancy at birth, still conventional, but for um, women and men separated, for Western Germany separated, so life expectancy at birth. And when you think about this idea of tempo effects, you can see that in these years where the gap was increasing towards um, the favor of the West, we see that life expectancy in the West, these are the bold lines, was increasing much stronger. And in the East, we had almost no, no change above all among men. The closing of the gap, it was reversing then. So the trends continued or decreased a little bit in the, so the increase declined a little bit in the West, but we had very strong increases in the East. And then in the last years, we have basically a parallel development. So thinking of tempo effects could mean that what we observe here could be heavily impacted by this, what Bongartz and Fini calls, call tempo effects. And so in the last two slides, I um, want to compare the results, now the differences between East and West, according to these two different um, ways of measuring period mortality. So these thin lines is what I showed you two slides before. So this is for men, the difference between West and East German um, life expectancy conventionally. 
with this increase until three and a half years in 1990, and then a decrease to 1.2 years. And when we look at the tempo-adjusted figures, the story is quite different that is told there. So first, we have not this, the difference is smaller. So this is the first issue. So it's not in three and a half years difference, it's only two years difference. Also, the, um, the increase is not that, that steep of this gap. But also then, there's not an immediate change, there's an immediate halt. And I think for what we know about mortality and factors that are influencing this, it might seem a little bit more plausible than an immediate decrease. But this is, of course, an issue of discussion. And we see that in the tempo-adjusted figures, there's not so much change after unification. So it went down only by 0.7 years instead of a decrease of um, more than two years that we have in the conventional life table. So very different, very different kind of story that is told here. And for women, it is um, similar. So we have here a an, an, an decrease. But what we see in the conventional um, life expectancy, that there's almost no difference anymore. What is also very strange, when you think of the economic situation in Eastern Germany, high um, unemployment rates, the socioeconomic problems, that there's almost no difference anymore. This is not visible in the tempo-adjusted rate. So there's still a difference of 0.7 years. And also the decrease started a little bit later and not, not that steep. So what I forgot here to tell you is, when I look at this figure here for, for the men, the conventional life expectancy differences between East and West among men, and compared to this line here, this reminds me very much, this is example that I started with, with this death rate that was increasing then with this um, tempo effect and then decreasing, although there was no, no real um, in increase of mortality, but the rate increased. And I think this looks very similar to the situation what we, what we can see here when we compare this line with the tempo adjusted line. Okay, so I want to con conclude with three, three conclusions that I learned for, my, for myself or that I um, take for myself from this work of the last years. And the, the first is that I think using conventional period life expectancy or period rates in general for analyzing mortality conditions of real people can be misleading. So this is an important mess, um, le lesson that I, that I learned from this discussion. And I also think that the additional use of alternative measures, be it tempo-adjusted measures or this cross-sectional cohort averages, is useful and necessary when we really under want to understand what's going on in this cross-sectional changes in mortality. And finally, a lot of methodological work is still needed, obviously, for understanding and adjusting this so-called tempo distortion in period mortality. So we are still somehow in this process of understanding everything. And therefore, I would like to use this occasion of this um, special day to thank John Grant for giving us the ideas that still fascinate us 350 years later. And we are still not really clear with this life table how we should interpret it, how we should take it, and um, how we should use it. Thank you very much.